Uh, so um, I would have uh, liked to welcome everybody on the campus at uh, Rice University in Houston, but uh, SES, uh, virtual uh, welcome uh, to uh, everybody. Um, I hope everybody is uh, well. Um, so uh, we have four organizers, uh, Zhong Hao Chu, Pen Chen Dai, Ming Yi, and myself. And uh, uh, our, well, we're excited about uh, the uh, uh, the symposia, uh, there's uh, more than 200 people who have registered, so it should be exciting. Um, the uh, idea uh, of the symposium uh, is that you know, we would like to highlight uh, the recent developments of this uh, exciting field, uh, but at the same time, uh, we would like to have uh, plenty of uh, discussions that could potentially impact a uh, future of development of uh, uh, this field. And this uh, is a pretty good uh, time for the field as uh, we uh, are at the uh, first part of the second decade of the field. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we want uh, the symposia uh, to be as informal as possible. And uh, we tried to group uh, the talks uh, with uh, uh, some overlaps uh, as close as possible. Uh, sometimes that means that uh, they are uh, consecutive, but uh, uh, 10 or 11 hours apart uh, due to the time zone uh, differences of the speakers. Uh, and so in that case, what we'll do, at least for most of talks, uh, is that we'll record the talks and uh, upload the videos uh, that you can uh, find a link to uh, from the website, uh, from the symposium website. Uh, and we'll do that uh, immediately after session. So if you cannot make it to a session due to time zone uh, differences, uh, you could uh, uh, see what happened in the previous session uh, immediately uh, after uh, the end of that session. So that's uh, Point number one uh, in the spirit of uh, having discussions. Uh, the second point is that uh, if you go to the symposium website, uh, you'll see that there's a link uh, to a document that has a, a list of open questions. So as uh, we uh, go on with the uh, symposia over the next uh, three days, uh, will be uh, we meaning the organizers will be updating the document as uh, we hear the talks uh, or, and we would urge uh, everybody uh, to send us uh, what you think uh, to be the most outstanding uh, questions in the field of ion-based superconductors that are worthy of uh, future studies. And uh, so uh, the idea is that we'll compile, compile this list. Uh, some of them will discuss uh, in the open discussion slot at the uh, last session of the symposia on Wednesday. Uh, but obviously, uh, or we hope at least the list will be long enough that uh, uh, we cannot cover that in a 30 minute open discussion slot. Uh, so what the idea is that we'll continue after the symposia, there will be a ion-based superconductivity seminar series uh, that uh, we'll be uh, uh, organizing uh, uh, for the rest of this semester. And the first of that will be happening two weeks uh, after the end of the symposium will be Wednesday, I think February the 3rd uh, at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Central Time US. Uh, so that uh, will be given by uh, Professor Chong Chung Wu uh, from uh, UC uh, SD. Uh, so those are the main two points which I want to cover. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, I want to thank the staff of the Rice Center for Quantum Materials. I believe uh, Ginny Whitaker is uh, here. Uh, uh, even though it's a virtual uh, event, uh, there's still a lot of details and uh, Ginny and uh, Alice Chow took care of all this. So if you have, uh, uh, please thank them when uh, you have occasion, private chat and all that. Uh, but if you have, uh, uh, issues, uh, 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 if you could uh, email uh, Ginny or Alice, I'm sure they'll uh, be happy to help you. So uh, with that, without further ado, let me turn over to
to Zhou Hao. Okay, thank you, Chimiao. So today uh, in the morning session, we'll have uh, three exciting talks. Uh, the first one will be given by Nigel Hussey uh, from Raybon University and uh, my maker Highfield Lab. So Nigel, would you like to share your screen? Sure, thank you. Can I hope you can all see that? Yes, we can see your screen. And, then and hear me okay? You. Okay, great. Well, so is all yours. thank you. Thank you very much, Chimao and Junho, Peng Chang and Ming for organizing this workshop through some um, very trying circumstances. And, and I guess for many people, this is the first meeting of 2021. So let me also take the opportunity to wish you a less eventful year than we had previously. Um, in view of uh, time, I hope you will forgive me for um, only giving a rather brief introduction. I understand this is the first talk of the workshop and I would have liked to give a, a longer introduction to some of the issues, but uh, I'd like to spend some time also showing new data if that's uh, possible time permitting. Okay, so uh, my, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators in this work. Um, work done with James Analytis and his team in Berkeley. Also work done in Tokyo and Kyoto by Taka and Yuji, Taka Shibauchi, Yuji Matsuda and Shigeru Asahara, colleagues at Bristol and my uh, group members in Red Belt University as well. So in particular, the work of my former student, Salvatore Licciadello, and my student who's now a uh, doctoral prize fellow, Jake Ayers, and my postdoc, Mattia Chulo. So, uh, I think, you know, the idea of there being a uh, nematic critical point in uh, materials has been um, pursued quite ardently over the last decade or so. And it's clear that there are many strongly correlated materials that now exhibit some form of nematicity somewhere in their phase diagram. So this breaking of rotational symmetry um, below some temperature associated often also with a structural transition. And there have been also um, a lot of theoretical work looking at the possibility that coupling of uh, the quasi particle excitations to quantum fluctuations of this nomadic order can give rise to anomalous transport, strange metallic transport, or non fermi liquid behavior. I'll just give a few examples here. But often, you know, so what we'd like, of course, is to find a material where we can um, say tune across the nomadic on a critical point and explore signatures or look for signatures of strange metallicity in that material. Um, and in, unfortunately, in most cases where the matic order is observed, it's also strongly coupled to a second order parameter. Um, and one of the probably the most beautiful examples of quantum critical metal, which is the phosphorus doped barium 122 material. Uh, here, the non thermal liquid behavior is linked to most likely then to the spin density wave PCP, which coincides with the pneumatic one in this material. And I just wanted to show here this uh, you know, beautiful series of experiments from Jane Mantis and Letus's group, showing in the resistivity as you approach the QCP from the overdoped side. Well, of course, the phosphorus here is isovalently doped, but um, as you tune, you find that the uh, T squared resistivity um, coefficient grows by roughly an order of magnitude, and which seems to be tied also with the growth in, a, in a, the effective mass measured by other techniques such as specific heat or even zero temperature penetration depth. The transverse magnetic resistance shows this remarkable uh, quadrature form, which I've written below here, and also this H over T scaling over more than a decade in temperature. And so this H linear magnetic resistance is really quite unusual. And it now appears to be seen in other correlated systems. And again, now seems to be a, another signature of strange metallic behavior in these, uh, in these quantum critical metals. And most recently, um, James also showed how the Hall coefficient has two components. And he labels here the strange metal component, which appears to be most strongly peaked 
at the QCP, around 30% phosphorus doping. And so, you know, which is something actually which de deviate, drops away with fields and also with temperature and doping. So those are really the three signatures that uh, um, we kind of focus on in, in this talk. And, you know, our sort of material of choice for looking for such signatures associated perhaps just uniquely with nematicity is the iron selenium iron chalcogenide material, which clearly undergoes this trigonal thermic transition and develops nematicity, strong nematicity in its Fermi surface and anisotropic spin fluctuations and also an anisotropic supermolecular order parameter below around 10 Kelvin. And quantum oscillation measurements, for example, have shown evidence for significant mass enhancement in this material. We showed also that the resistivity is T squared at low temperatures with a very large coefficient consistent with dominant electron, electron scattering. So what you'd like then is to find tuning parameters that enable you then to suppress this pneumatic transition down to zero temperature and follow the behavior, the function of the tuning parameter. <clears throat> but what that happens, so one of those is of course pressure, but interestingly what's found here is, so here I show uh, effectively the pneumatic susceptibility measured by Raman spectroscopy. And you see here low frequencies as you approach the pneumatic, the onset of pneumatic order, you see this marked increase of almost divergence of the pneumatic susceptibility. But then as you increase pressure, that divergence gets sufficient, um, systematically suppressed. And that suppression, uh, as so I think that here the uh, putative pneumatic critical point should be around about two gigapascal, so just between the last two panels. And this uh, suppression has been uh, attributed to the quenching of the criticality by the, the, the concomitant growth of long range magnetic order, as you see in this phase diagram here. So before the pneumatic order is suppressed, you get this development of spin density wave phase. And interestingly, this the growth of this appears to also tie in with the growth of superconducting transition temperature with, dope, uh, with pressure. An alternative way to tune the pneumaticity away is to, of course, use sulfur. And there it's shown indeed that actually the uh, pneumatic susceptibility is measured by elasto resistivity measurements does indeed appear to peak at the point where the uh, TS goes to zero. And so this is interesting because then that suggests that there is indeed uh, signatures of criticality in this system. And at the same time, measurements of the uh, spin lattice relaxation rates suggest that while, of course, as you cross the, into the nomadic phase, the, there's no enhancement of magnetic fluctuation, but they do develop below TS. But as a function of X, although they seem to peak, interestingly, where TC peaks, they do gradually disappear. So at least here where the susceptibility, the matic susceptibility is peaking, the uh, spin fluctuations themselves appear to be becoming more suppressed. So that does suggest that you may have here, the criticality itself is related to the pneumaticity and not with accompanying uh, criticality of the spin fluctuations. Okay, so with that in mind, we measured uh, a series of uh, samples, single crystals of this iron selenium sulfur. Um, and what we found uh, was um, very systematic behavior where you go from this T squared behavior in the pure material to a linear behavior at a doping close to the critical point, and then revert back to uh, T squared behavior um, as you go beyond it. Now here I write these FSS 16, as so though this is normally 16%. So our samples are, uh, this is the nominal X values. And so there may be in, cer in certain uh, samples, these may be slightly different to the uh, actual values. However, the, the behavior that we observed has been um, essentially confirmed by uh, Amalia's group uh, in a recent paper where they showed also for X equals zero, you get this low, T squared behavior below around four or five Kelvin. You then at around 17%, where the, near the, where the critical point is, 
you have T linear resistivity down to the lowest temperatures that were measured. And then at around 25%, you see this development of a much flatter T squared behavior. And indeed, it was also seen quite early on in a, in a paper, which unfortunately was ne never seen to be published by Arata and co-workers, where again, they suppressed in perhaps in a smaller field than we were using, we were using here 35 Tesla, that the resistivity around the pneumatic critical point was indeed vanishing linearly with temperature. And you see it around 21. So just beyond, you get this crossover to more quadratic behavior. I think it's important to suggest here, you know, that this linearity of course, we haven't extended it down to the lowest temperatures yet, but assuming that it does cross over at some point to T squared behavior, you can at least get some maximum, or sorry, minimum value for the coefficient of that T squared behavior. And I just want to compare here the slopes measured both by ourselves and by Amalia's group for the 25% samples around 25 nanometer centimeters of K squared. So this is the A coefficient of the T squared term. And then the minimum values that you'd expect if you were to cross over here to T squared behavior. And then this shows that there's a basically a sort of 15, at least 15 or 20 fold increase in the coefficient over what is rather a narrow doping range as you approach CP. And just compare that with what was seen in uh, bearing 122, where again, you was beyond the, the spin density wave quantum critical point. And here, say even over a wider range of P, the variation here is only about the order of seven or eight. So it's really significant variation in the coefficient. And so we should do this systematically and you can see this crossover here, I show the derivative. So where you have a linear derivative here shows the T squared behavior crossing over to a T linear or flat derivative at high temperatures and close to the quantum critical point, you get this linear behavior down to around about 1.5. So certainly in terms of the resistivity, you know, one of those signatures, I think, is quite clearly there that you do see non fermi liquid behavior. You see a regime below which you recover T squared behavior and a coefficient, particularly from the higher X value side, which appears to show a marked increase on approach to the common group. OK, so the second aspect was the magnetoresistance and this remarkable quadrature form of the magnetoresistance observed in barium 1 2 with H over P scaling. So in iron selenium, you see something which doesn't look like it scales, which shows rather a complicated behavior, even for a sample close to the QCP. However, when we took the derivative of this magnetoresistance with respect to field, we found something quite surprising. So here I show one for the nominal 10% sample, and you see here at low fields, it's clearly quadratic, so the, the coefficient is T linear. But then at high fields over a very wide doping range, a field range, you see that the, you can effectively fit this to a, a constant plus a linear term, which means that the effectively the magnetoresistance is B plus B squared. And if you subtract off this high field B squared component, what you find is then a magnetoresistance, which is linear in field from about three or four Tesla, and does show the fit here is almost perfect fit to this quadrature form, which was originally seen in the barium 122 material. So somehow the quadrature magnetoresistance was sort of hidden uh, or you know, is, is observed in combination with, uh, you know, more, let's say more conventional pure B squared magnetoresistance. Again, this is something which was seen similarly by uh, Amalia's group, where again, here's show derivative around a similar doping level. And you can see again, this behavior of this sort of B plus B squared form at high fields and the B squared term at low field. And what was really striking about this is that it was actually there at, at, at all doping levels. So here I just again show the, the full derivatives of some respective curves all at 15k. So this is all above the superconducting transition temperature. And again, subtracting off this high field B square term, you see essentially the same form underlying this, which is this quadrature form of the magnetoresistance. And you can isolate that and compare it right across the series. And you see basically at the same temperature, the form looks almost identical. 
And also you can observe H over T scaling by just comparing the data as a function of temperature. So this quadrature, H over T scaling magnet resistance appears to be coming from the strange metal regime. You could associate this with the, uh, the T linear resistivity. Um, and so this to our mind gave us evidence that there were in fact two charged sectors in this in iron selenium sulfur. And again, if uh, just to make this even clearer, what we looked at a sample uh, from James's group, which had a, a residual resistivity, which was about five times higher than the sample that we'd measured. And here it seems that the magneto resistance is only showing this quadrature form. So here you see the linear magneto resistance. You can scale it against H over T. It's as though the orbital magneto resistance, the conventional component, has been quenched by disorder. But remarkably, this quadrature component appears to survive. So again, we see quite clear evidence then for this second signature of strange metallic behavior, um, but interestingly observed across the whole, uh, let's say, uh, temperature and X uh, phase diagram that we've studied. And finally, we'll to see whether there's any evidence for uh, unusual anomalous Hall coefficients and I'm reminding you what was seen in the penictides. So here is low field Hall effect measurements taken by um, Taka and Yuji's group. And as you see, as you approach towards the QCP, effectively the low temperature RH is getting enhanced progressively. Interestingly, the Hall angle is going as T squared in a regime where the resistivity is predominantly T linear. So we're exhibiting this so-called separation of lifetimes that was famously seen, first of all, in the cuprate materials. There's also been seen in penictides and heavy fermions, among others. So here again, we're seeing an enhancement as you approach the QCP at the low temperature regime of the Hall coefficient. We wanted to look a bit more closely at the field dependence. And so again, we looked at high field Hall coefficient data. This is data which is currently unpublished. It shows quite a complex but systematic evolution with temperature field and X. And what we do here is we assume again, taking our lead from the magneto resistance, that we have two components to the sigma xy, the normal metallic component and the strange metal component. And noting again from, um, from uh, James Analytics' group that the strange component appears to be uh, suppressed in magnetic field, we assume then that the high field term is predominantly given by sigma xy normal metal. And because of the fact that the magneto resistance for the normal metal component is purely H squared, that suggests very strongly here that we have perfect charge compensation. And so we assume that rho xy for the normal metal component is strictly H linear. And then you can invert this to get the sigma xy for this component. And this is the form then we fit to the as uh, measured sigma xy. Whereas we, we have, um, you know, taking this assumption that at the high fields is where this, this uh, strange metal component will be suppressed. And so what you see here is the, is the fit at different X values and the, in blue is the residual which would take as this second component. Now this may seem quite somewhat arbitrary, but we have tried uh, to look at um, you know, two carrier, three carrier models, compensated or uncompensated, and none of those were able to fit the data uh, satisfactorily at all fields and temperatures. Co con you know, co how should I say, concomitantly with the magneto resistance. So here ultimately is the rho xy. And again, these, these lines are effectively uh, this form um, multiplied by h. So it looks like you're getting a similar type of behavior, but again, there are assumptions built into this. So I wouldn't take it too literally at this stage. But if you take the height or you know, this, the maximum value here and look at this as a function of X and T, and we can compare it with the strength of the H linear magneto resistance. So this beta SM was the H linear magneto resistance. And here is the, uh, whole, the additional anomalous Hall component. We see quite a reasonable correlation. So what you're seeing here is in the, this is in the T linear regime marked gray. And then the white is the 
is the T squared regime. And you see at low dopings as you go towards the T squared regime, these components seem to get smaller. It's also seen uh, on the other side of the dome at 25. And closer to the critical point, these components appear to be getting larger as you go down in temperature. So the interesting correlation between the two effects. And finally, we now having got both components, we can look at how they evolve together as a function of temperature. So I'm plotting here Rh versus one over T. Here is the total as measured value at 16 and 20 values. And you notice that actually the, the strange metal component appears to just grow as one over T, whereas the normal component is almost constant as a function of temperature. And so what you imagine now is that the, at high temperatures, you're getting this predominantly dominated by the strange metal component, at low temperatures, it's getting shorted out by the normal component. And obviously, we'd have, we would like to get somewhere somewhere in between here to see how these two things evolve. So again, going back to the iron barium 122 material, it does seem that there are, again, similar, very similar signatures of strange metallicity, strange metallic behavior seen in the iron selenium material. And so, you know, this first sight suggests, well, you know, maybe then we can say that there is indeed quantum critical uh, behavior, which is purely associated with nematicity in this material. But this comes hand in hand with some very beautiful quantum oscillation work that was done by Amalius group, which showed quite clearly that there was no or very small mass enhancement measured uh, as given by quantum oscillation measurements across XC. And this is actually quite reminiscent of the situation in the strontium ruthenium material where strange metallic transport is clearly observed, like a, a, an enhancing A coefficient crossing over to T linear behavior. And at the same time, no enhancement in most of the Fermi surface across uh, this critical field in this case. And this has recently been explained as due to effective scattering of hot regions in case space. So you have most of the Fermi surfaces cold, but from a transport perspective, those cold regions are rendered hot by being scattered into these hot regions where in this, in the Ruthenate case, there is a high density of states and therefore a higher proliferation of scattering in and out of those regions. Whether the same um, model can be applied to iron selenium sulfur still waits to be seen. Should be added too that this, you know, these signatures of strange metallic transport are also seen in cuprates particularly in the overdope cuprates, where again, there's no clear indication of mass enhancement. So that's quite a curious feature of these status. So in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to um, show you maybe again, looking for further evidence here by looking in the pressure plane. So there was following this very systematic, comprehensive measurements done by uh, Yuji and Taka, where they looked at the effectively the transport as a function of X and pressure and found that as you know, the nomadic regime is uh, systematically suppressed as you add sulfur, the spin density wave phase basically gets shifted to higher, um, high, to higher values in the pressure plane. And therefore you, you, the idea, thinking is then that also in the pressure plane, there may be a region where you're delineating between the nematic order or the nematic critical point and the spin density wave critical point. Indeed, this is exactly one of the things which uh, Amalia's group did. I'm sure we'll hear further about that in the next talk. So going at around X is 11, they showed indeed that nematic criticality appears to be quenched in the system, even though NMR measurements suggest that these two phases, these two critical points uh, are actually isolated. Therefore, the nematic Phase should have shown evidence of um, you know, the, the transport or the mass going critical. That wasn't seen. <clears throat> but actually, quite recent USR data uh, around the similar doping suggests actually that before the nomadic order is suppressed, there is the emergence of at least slowly fluctuating moments, which may also again cause, like they did in iron selenium, in pure iron selenium, cause a suppression of the nomadic criticality. So what we wanted to do was to look at an even higher X values, in fact, at X values beyond the, uh, the critical points around 18 and 20 
percent sulfur content where really although you know we don't expect here to be critical we clearly seeing uh, uh, we expect to see it let's say um, the departure further away from criticality associated with the nomadic critical point and maybe an emergence of the critical behavior associated with the magnetism okay so this is what we did so this is quite a complicated plot but let me just walk you through it so what you've got here is the resistivity these different colors indicate different pressures in kilobar and you have both a zero field and 35 tesla data so you see the 35 tesla data in both cases always overlaps with the 30 this is with field uh, parallel to the conductive plane so there's no additional magneto resistance here and again if you take the, the derivatives of this temperature dependence so here, this is the ambient pressure data. So you can see this crossover from T squared to T linear behavior in both cases. But then as you go increasing pressure, this T squared component goes down slightly, but, and this T linear term also goes down. But what's surprising is that there is an emergence of a second T squared term in the derivative. So obviously this will extend all the way down to low temperature, but it's sort of hidden at low temperatures by this higher A coefficient. So we label these three coefficients, A for the low temperature T squared term, B for the T linear term, then A prime for the second term, which emerges and it actually extends over to a much higher temperature. And then we plot that as a function of uh, pressure of the two systems. So you see here the A term is dropping. I should remind you this value of around 75 is intermediate between what we saw so the 25%, which is around 25, and around 16% where it's over 300 or so in nano ohm centimeters per Kelvin square. The B term is also dropping. And just oh, clearly there's some variation in carrier density here. And so to kind of take that into account, we looked at the value of the resistivity outside of these regimes around 75K, and you see this dropping away by about 30%, 40% or so. These changes in the B coefficient are actually much larger and they seem to be very correlated with the variation in the T squared component. So we, we assume here that this drop is due to both an increase in carrier density and a decrease in scattering rate as we move further away from the nomadic QCQ. The most striking behavior though is in this A prime component. So this is this T squared term which extends up to around 30, 40 Kelvin it starts off extremely small. So it's more than an order of magnitude smaller, but very rapidly it grows. So it grows by roughly an order of magnitude for the 18% sample in the pressure range that we've uh, studied. And this growth again appears to be correlated with the growth in TC. And as we know from all the measurements that have been done in pressure under pressure, this growth in TC is believed to be due to an emerging or, or strengthening of magnetic fluctuations. And so what we can do is ascribe this increasing T-squared coefficient to the emergence of that, uh, or that approach to the magnetic quantum critical point. And that's what's quite remarkable here is that you actually see the two things separated, suggesting that indeed they're actually coming from different sources. So the scattering due to the magnetism and the scattering which occurs at ambient pressure and would appear to be predominantly due to nematicity actually have these different uh, pressure dependencies and uh, different uh, origins. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusions. So but iron selenium sulfur basically shows a number of what's called classical signatures of strange metallicity upon suppression of the electronic pneumatic phase by sulfur doping. These are very much similar to those done seen in uh, Iron, very iron 122. And so one might also argue, well, does this not then mean that this is also basically scattering of critical fluctuations of a magnetic origin? And if that is the case, then the critical point at the critical point around 17%, we should also see evidence for magnetic criticality, which as far as I'm aware, has not been seen. Yet. The normal state magneto resistance and the Hall effect show two distinct components one of which displays these strange metal uh, characteristics. And we believe this is actually one of the first times where we see a coexistence throughout the quantum critical fan of two charged sectors, one 
the normal metal component and one the strange metal component. And so it's really intriguing to see how these two evolve as a function of uh, the tuning parameter and temperature. The pressure dependence of the resistivity beyond XC does show evidence for two, let's say, T squared coefficients, which show very strong pressure dependence. The second one of which appears to be correlated with TC and therefore is likely to be of a magnetic origin. And then this, I think, leaves the question open. Chiyo Mel was talking about open questions. I would say here, this clearly suggests, it's very suggestive that the origin of strange metal transport is tied to the pneumatic criticality at ambient pressure, but you know, time will tell. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel, for the beautiful talk. So we're running a bit behind the schedule, but uh, I think we have time for one or two quick questions. So I saw uh, Daniel Komsky. Yeah, uh, I have one question. Uh, in quite a lot of systems, uh, uh, superconducting dome is centered around quantum critical point and TC is maximum uh, uh, above critical point. But here it seems to be not the case. Is it true for uh, at least for uh, pneumatic quantum critical point? TC is yes. actually lower. Yeah, that, that's um, that's true. In fact, this color if color. anything, that there is a small peak in the TC around 10, 11 percent. Um, which may coincide with the strengthening magnetic fluctuations seen around that doping level. Um, and also you find in the pressure domain. Uh, Can you show you actually this last plot when you had uh, this uh, uh, pressure dependent for different X? That's actually yes. Yep. In plot. So, so there I showed you yeah, TC. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, this color, no, 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 this color plot with many uh, color. Yeah. Well, no, previous one. <laughs> I have this one, yeah, okay. Here it looks like uh, uh, quantum critical point for pneumatic is a minimum TC. Maybe it is actually a maximum TC is close to uh, SDW critical point. Is it possible? It's possible that, yes, that the, these peaks here coincide with uh, where yeah spin density wave phase disappears. That's, that is possible. But clearly it looks to, a, it's certainly with measurements in the pressure domain that the growth in TC is tied with, certainly with more with the, the magnetic, the strengthening of magnetic interaction. But at least pneumatic quantum critical point, it's not a maximum TC, definitely. No, it isn't, no. Okay, very good, thank so you. The, I guess here, yeah, the question here was whether the pneumaticity and the critical fluctuations associated with that could drive strange metal transport rather than be the origin of. Oh, no, I just have in my DC diagrams. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great. The next one is uh, Chim Yao. Um, yeah, Nigel, uh, beautiful talk. So uh, I, I want to sort of follow up uh, along similar spread just to see uh, what is universal among these different types of quantum critical points and what is uh, uh, perhaps unique. Um, the uh, If you go back to the phosphorus dope, the barium one to two, uh, clearly there the mass uh, is maximized uh, at the quantum critical point. And that's very typical of heavy fermion quantum critical point and other uh, metallic quantum critical points that we're familiar with. Uh, are you suggesting that at a pneumatic quantum critical point, uh, the mass being maximized at near the quantum critical point is not the case? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the question here is, you know, what are you know what we're looking at here is signatures in the transport, mm -hmm. and you know normally we we tie the uh, A coefficient to the effective mass through the right. say the Kadawaki Woods scenario, but this is not always the case. So I, as I mentioned in the strontium ruthenium material, um, there the A coefficient increases significantly as you approach the critical point with magnetic field, but uh, the effective mass is measured by quantum oscillations do not show similar enhancement. And that's and something you know, that's quite uh, unusual, but the, you know, in, in the cuprates, for example, as you go from the edge of the superconducting dome, right. you see, you know, the, the development of this T linear behavior um, 
uh, without any uh, significant variation, again, in, let's say, M stars as determined by um, specific heat or from quantum oscillation experiments. So I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't think there is, you know, a, one type of behavior here, critical mm -hmm. behavior. So I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting. I mean, the hope is that here the, the situation is simpler than the Cooper rates. But uh, the the question is whether there's something like a Kadawaki Woods or other universal ratios that one can determine near uh, x equals 0 0.17 uh, mm -hmm. and see whether a coefficient enhancement is tied up with the mass enhancement or it is not. Right? Yeah. So it seems to me to be very much worth the effort. Indeed, yeah. I mean, there's something yet to do specifically at high field, because obviously we'd like to look at the low temperature gamma coefficient. It's something we are, we are trying to develop at this, this moment, but we are, we're not yet in ready to make those types of measurements. Thank you. Something we have, would plan to do, yes. So one last question before we move on to Amalia's talk uh, from Pavel. Uh, I'd like to ask whether there is any systematics in the dependence of the residual resistivity or not on uh, sulfur doping or on pressure. Is there any systematic behavior that one may see? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of, as a function of S, um, it's not, well, clearly ion selenium has an extremely low residual resistivity because it's the it's the stoichiometric material. In fact, this is just a, well below one microohm centimeters. Then, typically across this regime, we see values of rho of not varying very much actually. So, in, in as function of sulfur content, of course, you're adding further disorder, um, but they stay between around, let's say, five and fifteen microohm centimeters, but no real systematic variation. As a function of pressure, um, there is um, certainly a, a drop, but there you're having to dis differentiate between the variation due to increasing carry density, um, which is clearly happening as a function of pressure, um, but there is a drop in the residual resistivity as, as you change the pressure. Uh, thank you again, Nigel. So, Nigel, if you can unshare the screen, and then Amalia, you can share the screen. Amalia, oh, good. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Amalia Kodia from um, Oxford. So she'll be talking about the um, quench uh, pneumatic uh, on the critical points in the software domain. So, so Amalia, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to you and a happy new year and a better year to all of you. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, specific electronic correlations uh, in the vicinity of the putative pneumatic critical points in the ion selenium sulfur tuned either by pressure with uh, sulfur substitution or uh, by, sorry, by chemical pressure or by applied physical pressure uh, in the 11% ion selenium sulfur. And uh, the Fermi surface of this material, as we know, they are multiband system, and I'm going to discuss the details from quantum oscillations and the quasi-particle masses. So firstly, let me acknowledge my collaborators, in particular, uh, Pascal Ries and Matthew Bristol from Oxford for their high field magnetic of high experiments. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, all our collaborators to have high magnetic field facilities, Dave Graf in Tallahassee, Alex in Nijmegen, William in Toulouse. And we couldn't do these experiments without having high quality crystals grown by Amir Shiv and previously by Shigeru in Tokyo. So we've been working in this area since 90, uh, 2014, and we've done lots of studies of our place to understand electronic structure but in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, quantum oscillations and a recent review of, of about the systems uh, is here. So uh, following on what we learned in the previous talk, uh, obviously a big question in understanding uh, ion-based superconductors, understanding whether magnetic or pneumatic crit critical fluctuations are responsible for enhanced superconductivity. 
So one of the early prediction for uh, an MRT criticality was if we have a tuning parameter, uh, we expect that in the vicinity of an MRT critical point, the resistivity to be non-fermi liquid and the superconductivity to be enhanced. So that means if we were to, to probe uh, uh, order parameter, we might expect that a, a quantum critical point as we vary a tuning parameter, we should have some divergent fluctuations. And in experiments, uh, quasi-particle effective masses are, are used to test if these scenarios are, are valid. So as we heard before, ion selenium sulfur series is an ideal case to search for evidence of pneumatic criticality and to tune uh, across the phase transition by suppressing pneumatic phase and search uh, for evidence of any unusual behavior. And as we can see and pointed out by a few of the questions in the vicinity of the pneumatic endpoint, superconductivity is not enhanced, but instead we have a small uh, enhancement inside the pneumatic phase. The phase diagram also shows that for higher doping, superconductivity slowly varies with composition. And uh, for the end member compound ion sulfur, resistivity versus temperatures here, one can see rec one recovers Fermi liquid behavior. Whereas inside the pneumatic phase, this behavior is very complex, as discussed by Nigel as well. And in a high temperature regime, we see the trends towards saturation and bad Fermi. Uh, bad, uh, bad metal be metallic behavior. So um, the one of the powerful technique to search for crit pneumatic criticality is to, to prove the pneumatic susceptibility of the systems. A pneumatic susceptibility is the anisotropy in resistivity, the in-plane anisotropy under a small amount of strain. And uh, the study done in Japan show that for ion selenium sulfur, the pneumatic susceptibility show to revised temperature and for composition close to 17%, then this, the intercept Q revised temperature is close to zero. While uh, Q revised is a good indication that a potential pneumatic critical point be present here, this is a mean free behavior. So it doesn't tell us too much about fluctuations and what happens at the critical uh, the, the quantum behavior, low temperature, and what effects this could have on superconductivity. So again, one more point about ion selenium. What we learn is that uh, besides uh, having an aromatic electronic order below uh, 89 Kelvin, the system couples also with the lattice. So that means when the system enters the aromatic electronic order, the lattice suffers distortion from tetragonal to orthorhombic. Um, from uh, lots of uh, studies uh, of RFS, we learn also that uh, orbital degrees of freedom play an important role and affects how the Fermi surface distorts. And we see very strong anisotropy as we enter the pneumatic phase. Furthermore, the electronic correlations, short range, long range, uh, and the effect of spin fluctuations, uh, I think, are very important, uh, but this is not I'm going to discuss today. Oh, sorry. So um, when we discuss about the coupling with the lattice, we have to remember that actually the lattice distortion from tetragonal to orthorhombic corresponds to acoust transverse acoustic phonons. So the distortion takes place along the diagonal of the uh, uh, tetragonal lattice, and these two are the two types of acoustic phonons. And um, uh, ex inelastic X-ray scattering, which could probe the acoustic phonon, also show there is a fine anemotic correlation length, um, and suggesting again that this can be described by a mean field theory, which cannot tell us about the nature of fluctuations at low temperatures. And besides using chemical pressure in this uh, talk, I'm going to also talk about the effect of applied pressure. As we heard earlier, uh, the pressure is a unique parameter 
combined with chemical pressure in the system allow us to really tune the pneumatic phase away from spin density wave phases. And in the 11%, we have a regime where there is no spin density wave, so we can easily look into the behavior of this point together with the behavior with the, in the case of the chemical substitution. So for this, we are using quantum oscillations, which is a very powerful probe of uh, Fermi surfaces and of identifying the behavior of quasi-particle effective masses. So in a quantum oscillation experiment, uh, due to lambda quantization, we see oscillations in the density of states and the frequency of these oscillations will be related to the extremal areas on the Fermi surfaces. So for example, here, in a case of a two-dimensional cylinder, uh, we have a minimum and maximum uh, frequency. And you can imagine that for a multiband system, the frequency spectrum becomes very complex. So quantum oscillations allow access to lots of other parameters. And using the lipschitz kosevich formulas, we can access directly the effective masses, which are cyclotonic average in a quantum oscillation experiment. And uh, if not somebody if, uh, can calculate the band masses and estimate the effect of electron phonon interaction, then directly from the quasi-particle effective masses, one can relate the effect of the strength of electronic correlations. So uh, let's remind ourselves a few aspects of the Fermi surface of ion selenium from our first studies. What well, we learned that the Fermi surfaces are extremely small and they are so much smaller compared with band structure calculations. So this is a DFT calculated Fermi surfaces having three whole bands and two electron bands, whereas uh, this will be a Fermi surface in the tetragonal phase, which shows we are only left with the whole band and a small pocket center at the Z point, whereas uh, and the two electron bands at the uh, brilliant zone. So this effects are very complex and there is still a, a lot of debate what causes all this renormalization and shrinking of the Fermi surfaces. Uh, and one of them also uh, touches upon the effect of orbitally dependent renormalization factors of the band structure. Whereas the, the bands which have XZ or YZ character are renormalized by factor three for the bands which have XY character in particular here, this gamma band, this renormalization can be very large, eight to nine, and uh, in other calcondrodites can become even larger. So here is an example of how quantum oscillations look like. We measure resistance in a blind magnetic field we need extremely high fields to get, get over the upper critical fields. And in the normal state, we see quantum oscillations. We Fourier transform this spectrum and we have a complex spectrum of, of features. Uh, and today I'm going to focus mainly on the highest frequencies. Uh, so what we know from ARPES that the, in ion selenium, we have a quasi two dimensional cylinder and this will correspond to the uh, orbit delta and beta. So beta is the minimum and uh, delta is the maximum orbit on the cylinder. And the rest of the features will be associated with electron bands. And if we now follow the evolution of the system with uh, chemical pressure, uh, again, there are quantum oscillations um, across the whole series, but the spectrum of this oscillation changes quite a bit. And probably here it's worth reminding ourselves that we are dealing with a multiband system. So we, and uh, if you measure resistance, then uh, you have to think about of a parallel network resist resistor. So the, the channel which has the highest conductivity is going to dominate our response. And what we can see in the data, uh, this is the derivative to enhance the frequency spectrum. Uh, we can see that around 12%, uh, a very low frequency seems to dominate our spectrum and this low frequency disappears. But at the same time, we can follow easily the high frequency uh, components. So the delta is the, the extremal orbit on the whole band, which I'll focus on today. And we can see as a function of chemical pressure, this, uh, this band 
a position goes to higher and higher frequency, that means this, this pocket increases in size. I forgot to mention earlier that in ion selenium, the inner hole band as a function of temperature disappears, but uh, with sulfur substitution, it returns back again close to 11% where we start seeing this, this pocket. So the fact that a pocket disappears, whereas ARPA suggests that it should appear, is rather uh, unexpected. Now let's uh, look at the summary of our findings from quantum oscillations. So there are lots of graphs here. First of all, the, the full frequency spectrum versus X shows in general an increase in all the pockets. That means that the Fermi surfaces increases, the number of carriers increases, but there is this particular dominant highly mobile carrier uh, which seems to disappear together with the nematicity. And this is quite different from, uh, these are the ARPES data for the whole pocket, which show this anisotropy between the X and Y direction and the uh, uh, presence of this additional inner hole band from about 11%, but there is no indication of a disappearance of the pocket. Uh, moreover, here there is a slightly zoom out the effect of uh, superconductivity again showing that at the nematic endpoint, there's rather a drop and the enhancement which exists is inside the nematic phase. We also measure mm -hmm. magnetic transport in 34 Tesla, and this is just a derivative uh, of resistivity in 34 Tesla, which seem to uh, differentiate between the regime uh, below 11%. This is below, we have this three-dimensional uh, whole pocket appearing. So we call this phase, nematic phase A, uh, compared with the phase B, where, um, where we have this low frequency dominating, which disappears together with nematicity. Now let's look at the effect of applied pressure for the 11%. So this is temperature versus applied pressure. Uh, we can uh, nicely suppress nematicity within the same sample. So Doing pressure experiments, is, it's a beautiful way to tune phase transition without really changing the sample. So we are dealing with the same material. We do not indu induce additional degrees of disorder. And you can see here resistivity data show nice smooth behavior. There is no linear resistivity in the vicinity on nematic endpoint. And, but the, a possible linear behavior starts setting in as we move towards the spin density wave regime. Now, if we go back to quantum oscillations data, and again, focusing mainly on the highest frequency peak, which is the delta, is the, the whole band pocket, uh, we can see this increases similarly to the chemical pressure effects and uh, uh, a similar Lipschitz transition, uh, the disappearance of a dominant low frequency spectra occurs here as well. So there's a very good correspondence between the chemical and applied pressure in the system. Again, the frequency mainly increases in size, the number of carriers increases, whereas one of the pockets, seems, which is very mobile, uh, seem to disappear. Um, I'm going to come back to the effective mass in a minute, but you can also see that pneumatic phases compared with the outside the pneumatic phase under pressure this has very low Fermi energies. Uh, and here in the tetragonal phase, we, we increase the, significantly the Fermi energy as well. So as I said, uh, one effect that quantum oscillation see in addition to what we learned from ARPES data is that we have an unusually dominant low frequency pocket, which disappears together with nematicity. And one potential explanation for this is uh, we have to think about of a quasi two dimensional cylinder. You have two different lattice parameters if you have sulfur or if you have selenium. That means the degree of interlayer warping will increase as we move towards the sulfur end. And potentially, we, we have a topological Lipschitz transition where we lose one of the frequency because the, the neck of this cylinder disappears. Another possibility is. Uh, is effects cause in magnetic fields. In particular, for the case where you have very small pockets, you expect very strong spin polarization. 
which could cause some of the observed effects. So now let's concentrate on the uh, quasi-particle effective masses in the vicinity of the cinematic endpoints. And uh, this uh, effective masses are extracted from the amplitude versus temperature of the quantum oscillations. If uh, this dependence uh, varies significantly with temperature, that means the effective masses are very heavy. And this is for a 4% concentration deep inside the pneumatic phase. And this is for a concentration outside the pneumatic phase. So we can see already that the masses are quite heavy inside the pneumatic phase, but they become lighter uh, outside in the tetragonal phase. And this is a, a summary of all our findings for the uh, sulfur substitutive system. Uh, now, if we look on the smaller scale, uh, the changes are quite subtle. There is a both here, we, uh, I look at delta, which is the outer electron, outer hole band, but also we can detect for a certain regime also the gamma pocket, which is supposed to have dxy character and it's much heavier than the delta pocket. We can see both of them slightly increase, but for a higher concentration, we can only follow the delta pocket and then this uh, goes down again. Now, if I only look at the delta pocket and I add the uh, results uh, by Terashima for iron sulfur, what we can see is now a, a bigger picture of what really happens to the effective masses is that there is some variation inside the pneumatic phase with a small peak uh, in the middle of it. But then as we cross the boundary of the pneumatic endpoint, there is no divergence. The system does not really has a significant enhancement here. And we compare uh, this effective masses with the values of the A parameter uh, measure um, by us and by Nigel's group. I'll come, um, and then we can see that if we add the A parameter, this is on the left side and the effective mass is on the right side. Once we account for the nominal composition effects that Nigel used in his paper and shift all the, these points to the left, then we can see that all the data nicely follow us, a smooth variation, a slight increase towards 10% and then a decrease as we cross these boundaries. Also from our base, one can probe different velocities and they have a smooth variation across the pneumatic endpoint. And um, in this graph, I also added the, the data of all the possible experiments existing on the series, which probe the electronic uh, behavior of the system. So we have the effective masses from quantum oscillations, uh, red points. We have the A coefficient from transport data from two types of transport data, and also the gamma coefficient from specific E data um, measured by Matsuda's group. Uh, this is divided by two just to bring them on the same scale. Um, and here you can see that the trends in all this behavior is to have a slight increase before they decrease and there is no enhancement at the pneumatic endpoint. And now if we look at the pressure effects where we were looking for the same signature and um, again, we, are, we were interested to see if there is an enhancement so we could follow with quantum oscillations in a single sample, the behavior in, in very much detail and every time we see the same effects. The effective masses are quite heavy. So it's a quality system inside the pneumatic phase. They drop smoothly around the transition and then there's almost like a plateau, maybe slight increase at the higher pressure. So despite the fact the masses are not showing a, a, an enhancement, it's probably worth mentioning that the, the amplitudes uh, seem to be much more suppressed inside the pneumatic phase compared with what we expect from LK formula. So we think there is additional scattering inside the pneumatic phase, which probably affect, as we learn, uh, magnetotransport and transport behavior. So here's a summary now of the data under pressure, uh, looking at the effective masses and the A coefficient from the, the transport. And in both cases, a smooth behavior happens across the pneumatic endpoint. So the 
the critical pressure is supposed where the, uh, the pneumatic transition is suppressed is around six kilobar. And as you can see, there is no signature of enhancement in both of these quantities. Um, so now thinking about superconductivity, PC is represented by the open uh, triangles here. We can see that there is a very nice correlation between how the uh, quasi-particle masses and PC varies, telling us that uh, whatever caused the changes in the quasi-particle masses also affects superconductivity. Whereas as we go in a higher pressure regime, so now with pressure, we heard that we are moving towards a regime where potentially we go towards a spin density wave, we can see that this correlation is broken. So that suggests that probably the type of superconductivity we discuss in this regime is likely to be different from the type of higher pressure. So here the correlations seem to be weaker. The Fermi surfaces increases, so we expect that the carrier density to be much larger. So TC is likely to be enhanced for having more carriers. And uh, now uh, how this compares with uh, the, the system where we know that exists a magnetic critical point, the barium one to two that we also heard in the previous talk, we can see that they are striking the differences between these two materials. So in uh, barium one to two, we have a strong enhancements in, in the effective masses in the as they approach uh, the, uh, the magnetic critical point here. Uh, and there is a divergence in the mass. At the same time, there is a linear resistivity happening at the same place and the superconductivity is enhanced. So uh, I combine in the review paper, a graph showing this two system side by side for easier comparison. And uh, so what uh, we can learn from here, well, we learned that indeed in the presence of magnetic fluctuations, the effective mass are enhanced approaching this quantum critical point and PC has a strong enhancement. But in the case of the system where pneumatic fluctuations are um, supposed to be in the driving seat, we do not see a mass enhancement and we do not see an enhanced PC. So this is telling us two things, either that this superconductivity is not caused by pneumatic fluctuations or somehow uh, that uh, our pneumatic fluctuations are, are shifted in a different position. So we can see here that there is clear, a clear correlation between TC and effective masses, but it's inside, it's inside the pneumatic phase where we know spin fluctuations might be stronger. Uh, and one more point is probably also to think about that these correlations not only affect the quasi-particle masses, but also affect the sizes of the Fermi surfaces. So as we increase e X, we uh, increase the bandwidth and we are likely to, to reduce the strength of this correlation. And this is why also the Fermi surfaces keep increasing as, a, as we increase X both in the series ion selenium sulfur and also in the barium 1 to 2 system. So what can cause the suppression of the critical fact fluctuations uh, in ion selenium sulfur system? So one potential uh, reason for the suppression could be the uh, interaction with the lattice. And uh, in this theoretical work has been suggested that if there is a a strong interaction with the acoustic phonons, there will be only two critical directions and the rest of uh, the system will, all the critical fluctuations will be suppressed. And the phase diagram for such a system will have temperature versus a coupling parameter between the electronic system and the lattice. Then we expect that in the presence of this coupling, the whole phase diagram to be shifted to a different location. So in reality, uh, the real critical point will be somewhere inside the, the pneumatic phase. At the same time, the, the transfer properties are expected to be non-Fermi liquid behavior and then to cross over to Fermi liquid at low temperatures. And here from the 
resistivity data under pressure, we, uh, we detect the, the, the Fermi liquid temperature of about 13 Kelvin in this case. And this allows us to estimate what will be this potential coupling parameter between the electronic system and the lattice. And these are the values that we get about 0 0.07 in this case. And uh, very recently, this approach has been also applied to Raman studies. And uh, what uh, Raman study says, uh, it also can detect uh, pneumatic susceptibility. And uh, from uh, the uh, intercept of uh, the Q revised temperature, they suggest that this intercept shifts to a different value. And they, they propose that pneumatic uh, Elastic, pneumatic elastic coupling shifts the position of the pneumatic critical point in the system due to this finite interaction. Uh, they also suggest that the itinerant and more localized type of carriers uh, could also be responsible for the Raman spectrum because they separate uh, the system into components. Um, interestingly, they uh, are able to uh, detect the values of the scaffolding parameter and suggest that sulfur ion selenium system has a much stronger coupling compared with our uh, other system like barium 152. We know that the systems are extremely soft, so we should expect that they will be prone to this effect. Now, if, if we have this coupling with the lattice, then we potentially uh, will be affected also in the transfer behavior. And uh, Theoretical studies by Rafael Fernandez group show that the resistivity coefficient, uh, which is here alpha versus the Fermi energy uh, and versus temperature, sorry, uh, temperature scale. Here, uh, as we cool down to low, low temperature, the, this exponent could vary from a value of 1, 1.3 towards 2. And as a function of the coupling with the lattice, this exponents will change significantly and they have very strong temperature dependence. And uh, if we look at our data under pressure, we extracted the uh, exponent and this exponent requires a very careful understanding of the low temperature residual resistivity, which can be extracted from high field data. We see that our exponent sits nicely around 3.2, close to the critical pressure, and afterwards, a low temperature, the system moves towards the Fermi liquid uh, behavior with n equals 2. And we can plot the data in different way by plotting directly resistivity versus uh, 3 over 2. So these are composition in the vicinity of the pneumatic endpoint, a high temperature. And we can see that over a very, very large temperature regime, this uh, uh, dependence seems to hold. Uh, the same for the pressure dependence in the vicinity of the pneumatic endpoint, uh, we have a very nice uh, three over two dependence. As I mentioned earlier, the theory suggests that no non-Fermi liquid behavior will occur uh, in a regime outside this uh, pneumatic endpoint, and eventually the system will, will show uh, Fermi liquid behavior, and this is what we see in our experiments. And a uh, few more points just to finish off is about the role of spin fluctuations. So, so far we were searching for pneumatic fluctuations and to see what role they play in superconductivity. But in ion selenium sulfur, we know that spin fluctuations are likely to be responsible for superconductivity. And uh, here, uh, this NMR study shows they are likely to be enhanced inside the pneumatic phase around 10%. And um, as compared to what we hear, heard before from Nadja's talk, we do identify linear P behavior for most of the samples inside the pneumatic phase. And even the 17% sample he referred to is just on the border. So it's uh, every time we are inside a pneumatic phase, there is a regime where a linear P behavior can be found over a, a limited temperature regime. Uh, eventually, all the materials will become Fermi liquids and we see quantum oscillations in all these concentrations. 
So now thinking about superorgan activity, so we learned that uh, in the presence of the coupling with the lattice, the superorgan activity is, is unlikely to be enhanced at, at the nematic uh, uh, critical point as initially suggested by theory, which do not consider the effect of the lattice. But also in this particular material, it's probably also is telling us that the, the pairing might ha have not been influenced by pneumatic fluctuations at all. So if the spin fluctuations are responsible, then we expect that when the spin fluctuations are strong, like inside the pneumatic phase, then we will see a, an enhancement in, in uh, superconductivity, which is what experiments show. A very small dome exists inside but not at the pneumatic endpoint. And this is my summary. So quantum oscillations gave access to the Fermi surfaces and also to the quasi-particle masses. And in particular, we can follow very well the behavior of the whole bands as a function of chemical pressure and applied pressure and search for evidence of uh, divergent fluctuations in the vicinity of the pneumatic endpoint. We could not find any divergence. We can see smooth variation of uh, quasi-particle effective mass in both cases, suggesting that uh, either uh, that this type of fluctuations are possibly quenched by the interaction with the lattice. And uh, from the transport point of view, uh, the inside the pneumatic phase, things are indeed very complex. Uh, but just outside, we find a, a region where resistivity follow a 3 over 2 power law and linear T behavior is in the vicinity inside the pneumatic phase over a, a, a limited regime. And again, we believe that this linear T is likely to be associated with spin fluctuation, which has been assigned also in other systems. Thank you. Thank you, Amalia, for this beautiful talk. So just a very quick comment, uh, and uh, I think this um, um, large pneumatic, um, pneumatoelastic coupling that shift the quantum critical points in the iron satellite system uh, is quite interesting. So in, in Wednesday, I think um, Matthias uh, Ikeda, he will be talking about his recent um, elastochloric measurements and then showing that in the cobalt bearing 122, the iron nictite session, uh, iron nictite system, the pneumatoelastic coupling actually vanishes uh, near the quantum critical point. So that's a very interesting contrast. And then uh, my group also has some independent measurements uh, showing the same with that. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's uh, have one or two quick questions. So I have uh, Peng Chen uh, raising hands. Peng yeah, Chen. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Amelia, for, for the very nice talk. Yeah, so I have two questions. The first question is uh, concerning the, uh, the quantum oscillation. So, so does twinning have any role to play? I mean, in terms of measuring the quantum oscillation from the endodope side to, to the uh, to the pure, you know, overdope side uh, uh, with a phosphor, because in the pure overdope side, it's a uh, it's tetragonal throughout, right? Whereas in the underdope side, the system actually have a, a tetragonal also rhombic phase transition. So, so that's one question number one. Let me ask both questions, then I'll just wait uh, for answer. So the other question I have is that uh, you said that the 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 the, the lattice coupling plays an important role in determining the differences between the uh, the phosphors and the sulfur dope samples. But but in the case of a phosphor dope samples. I mean, the transition is always first order, right? You have a couple, the structural and magnetic phase transition. Whereas in the case of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sulfur dope iron selenide, you only have the structural phase transition. So how, how do you, I mean, they, they both, you know, couple to the lattice somehow, right? How do you tell the differences between the two? Yeah, that, that, that's my two questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think the first question was about uh, when tuning. we determine yeah. quantum oscillations, if it we think tuning, about- does, does tuning play a role? If the tuning parameter plays a role, right? I mean, the, I mean, I, I, I was just curious. You know, the, the system. Okay, is so I think I to, yeah. uh, we have to think about what quantum oscillation measures. Actually, we measure areas. Okay, so if we think about what we probe, we measure cross-section areas. If that areas is slightly distorted, or if it's uh, completely isotropic. Uh, is still an area, and especially in the vicinity of the pneumatic endpoint, we know from ARPES that these areas become more and more isotropic. So in a way, you know, because quantum oscillation probes area, 
uh, is not affected by other parameters in a way we, you know, we measure an area. So it's the cross-section area of a Fermi surface and the quasi-particle cyclotron in average uh, quantity for that particular pocket. So you, so you do think the green boundary is scattering from the different domains plays a role? So, so the quantum oscillations are, are only observed if we do not make them incoherent in a way. So they need to have a particular phase. If we start scattering, they will be completely done. So that's the beauty of quantum oscillations. We can really access, because the samples are very clean, we can really access the, uh, the Fermi surface directly. Okay. Um, about the, um, the second question, yeah. The nematoelastic coupling, obviously, uh, what I'm proposing here is a way to try to understand why these pneumatic fluctuations are quenched. I mean, uh, one possibility, as I said, is th this criticality is even from theory is expected only to occur along certain direction. Only two direction will be critical. What we measure here is an average effect. So the question is, is it because we average out all the effects or is it because this, uh, it's a real effect and this pneumatic elastic coupling kills all these uh, fluctuations? But because PC is also suppressed, we know things are more severe. That means these critical fluctuations are really some, some, somehow quenched. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. One more question from Chim Miao. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, really nice talk, Amali. Uh, so I just want to take advantage of the fact that both you and Nigel are, are here and uh, see whether I understand where you agree, uh, namely uh, at the critical concentration, x equal to 0 0.17 ambient pressure, you both agree that there's a t-linear resistivity from say 25 or 30, 30 Kelvin down to say two Kelvin. Is that a fair representation? Uh, of, uh, so in other words, over a decade of temperature, there is T-linear resistivity. So I think probably what we agree, uh, well, I, I'll speak for myself first and then I'll let my <laughs> okay. agree or disagree with me. Um, so the linear T-resistivity Nigel is talking about is called 0 0.16, but 0 0.16 has a TS of 50 Kelvin. So that means 0 0.16 what is nominal composition and corresponds to a TC sample of 50 Kelvin. So if we go to the phase diagram, then 50 Kelvin is somewhere here, and that's inside the pneumatic phase where we also see linear T. So from the data point of view, both our data agree that inside the pneumatic phase there is a linear yeah, T. That, that's fine. I mean, I, I even don't, uh, for theorists, 0.16 and 0.17, I probably would not uh, cannot tell, at least for me. But uh, what the point I want to make is that to the extent that is the case, if I define the A coefficient of AT square uh, over that temperature range, then that A coefficient is very large. So uh, I'm somewhat confused as to why uh, there is T linear resistivity at that particular concentration, and yet the A coefficient is um, uh, is being described as very small or not uh, large compared so to the pyromagnetic case. We have data all the way to 0 0.3 Kelvin. So I think probably what's worth, I mean, these are difficult experiments to get all mm -hmm. the way to low temperature and to suppress the, uh, the magnetoresistance. You have to be in place to do longitudinal magnetoresistance studies in about 45 Tesla or higher. But I can give you another example. Look at the 4%, okay? This is very deep inside the pneumatic phase. And if you look at this data, you will say, well, this is linear T, okay? But we see very beautiful quantum oscillation. And if you zoom in within this regime, eventually is a T square dependent. I understand. So, so the point is that when one makes a statement about what the mass is or what the A coefficient is, one has to specify for which temperature range uh, that statement is being made. Is that a fair? Yes, uh, I think okay. we are talking about within the, the lowest possible temperature below 1.5. So our right. data right. are between 0 0.3 to 1.5. This is the kind of almost the ground state. Because in principle, I could take the point of view that maybe at the lowest temperatures, a lot of things happen. 
uh, coupling to the lattice. You know, in heavy fermion physics, we even see coupling to nuclear uh, spins, etc. But there's enough of a dynamical range uh, of, say, a decade or more, in this case, 30 Kelvin to 2 Kelvin, where things are more universal, like uh, uh, there's linear resistivity or A coefficient as defined in this temperature range is enhanced. And I wonder, for instance, the RPS, maybe either XY uh, band or, or XZ band would actually pick up some mass enhancement over that temperature range. I don't know whether that is the case, but I just want to raise that as a possibility to think about, and maybe there's the details uh, that can be probed. So, well, okay, Nigel. No, no, I mean, no, I think the, the data um, agree pretty well. I, I think the thing that, you know, you see from this plot, so at 25%, yeah, we see it T squared below around 10, 12 Kelvin. Amali sees it below nine Kelvin with a very similar coefficient. Around 18%, we see T squared below around five Kelvin. It's hard, I think, to claim it's two Kelvin there, Amali, with the number of data points you have, but it's sim a similar. But the coefficient itself is, is enhanced by about a factor of three as you get to 0.18. And then at 17%, the data I showed you does go down linearly down to about 1.5 K. And as, and as Chi Mao says, you know, if, if it does cross over eventually to T squared, it does have to have a very large A coefficient. So as you approach from the 25% towards the critical point, there is a, a reduction in the regime over which the T linear behavior is shown. And you plot that in your, in your measurement. And then there's also, you know, there has to be a significant enhancement in that regime. I think inside the nomadic phase, it's more complicated. But certainly on the outside phase, which is where we say comparing it with the bearing one, two, two, there is a similar behavior. So I think probably it's worth also looking to all the possible parameters you can measure. And here there's also specific heat, uh, gamma coefficient. And again, there is not really any enhancement. No, but I'm talking about, you know, as a, the approach towards you know, this XC from the uh, spectragonal side, where you can imagine the system being increasingly dressed by fluctuations associated with some order. That's... Yes, I mean, indeed, one can see that if we look at this graph, if we represent it over a bigger scale, because in the barium one to two system, we have to remember we started from the tetragonal towards the spin density wave. So when you move from here, you change the mass from about two to about 3.5. So that's what criticality and the values we were talking about in the barium one to two system. That's the enhancement. Here, if we look at the tetragonal phase end member, you can see again, this mass is much lower, it's just below three, and then it goes all the way to five. So there is mass enhancement as we approach the nematic phase. But as you can see, that enhancement seems to peak inside. So this is where the flux spin fluctuation seems to be the most enhanced. So that just probably yeah. points out that spin no, fluctuations are. No, I, I agree with what you're saying, Amalia. And you know, the data, I'm not disputing your data. I'm just uh, referring to Chiamal's question that I don't think there is any significant um, difference in the data in terms of how the, the resistivity evolves as you approach it from that side. That's all. And that, you know, it is a puzzle. I accept it's a puzzle why the, this coefficient has grows much more rapidly than the M star. And there's clearly some interesting uh, decoupling here from the usual Karawaki wood scaling. So. so I think we have an excellent topic for the open mm. discussions. <laughs> and I uh, <laughs> hope you two can <laughs> still join at that point. Um, and uh, we are very behind the schedules, but uh, it's good because we have a lot of uh, exciting discussions and then uh, beautiful talks.